This episode of Coffee with Kenobi is brought to you by MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. For all of your travel needs to the Disney theme parks, cruise lines, or anywhere you want to go on vacation, be sure to go to our affiliate link, which can be found in the show notes on the front of our webpage or on our Twitter feed, and sign up for a free, no-obligation quote. We are also brought to you by One Nation Coffee, the official brew of Coffee with Kenobi. For the best coffee in the galaxy, go to www.onenationcoffee.com and sign up for a subscription service so you never miss out on the best coffee in the galaxy. This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Vanessa Marshall, Harrison Dula from Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Coffee with Kenobi show number 280. We are your spoiler-free place for Star Wars discussion, analysis, and rhetoric. I'm here drinking One Nation coffee out of my Boba's Beans mug from Celebration Chicago. I know I drank out of the same mug last time, but it's a great mug, and I have washed it a couple times since then. It is a fun one to be sure. Speaking of fun ones, on today's show, we will be sharing our memories of The Phantom Menace in honor of the 20th anniversary of this film. And of course, later in the show, I will be joined by CWK newsman Tom Gross to talk about the latest in the world of Star Wars. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite coffee mug, and let's have some coffee with Kenobi. So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first? Joining me today for a cup of coffee are two huge Star Wars fans, and as it just so happens, are big fans of our topic for today, which is, of course, Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace on its 20th anniversary. First, I'm going to bring in a writer at Geek & Sundry, Marvel, Nerdist, and StarWars.com, Kelly Knox. Hi, thanks for having me. Of course. Look at that byline. You are one busy person. <laughs> I try. That's fantastic. I love it. Um... Kelly and I started chatting because of the article that she uh, or the Dan posted recently, uh, our memories of the Phantom Menace. And Kelly was kind enough to invite me and other StarWars.com contributors to this. So this is going to be fun. I agree. It was really fun just reading those stories. So it'll be fun to hear a little bit more about maybe you you two. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Also joining us, this is a gentleman who's been on the show a number of times. I got to hang out with him very briefly at Star Wars Celebration, but it's always great to see him and chat with him. And of course, I'm talking about the co-host of Idiots Array, Ryder Waldron. Hey, Dan, thanks for having me back. And it, it really feels like we should have a movie release this weekend because like we had talked about, I'm usually on the week of a, the week of a premiere. So this feels kind of weird, but I'm excited to be here. I know, I know. Well, nevertheless, <laughs> we're still going to let you stay on. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Always great to talk with you. All right, both of you, um, as I said at the top of the show, are big fans of Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Now, clearly, as as uh, history has shown, The Phantom Menace was met with some, some mixed reviews at first, but that didn't seem to stop at the box office. It very much was a juggernaut. Uh, it certainly added a lot to the Star Wars mythology, and we've got a lot of memories and a lot of reflections on it. Now, a couple of months ago, we did sort of... Uh, a look back at the top things we love about the Phantom Menace. So this isn't really going to be that specifically. It's going to be more of our memories, of course, key moments from the film and characters may come up, but this is very much more all encompassing. And I'll start off. Uh, and this was the, the section that I contributed to Kelly's article. But for me, there was a contest uh, for the Phantom Menace when it came out. Now, leading up to this movie, USA Today had this uh, blurb in their live section where every day they would give some sort of piece of Star Wars trivia either related to the original trilogy or the creation of Episode One: The Phantom Menace. So I subscribed to USA Today just so I could get that every day, and I cut them all out. Then I made this scrapbook of it because I was just so fired up about it. Um, just hearing myself say it out loud, I sound like such a dork, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm very okay with that. that. <laughs> For sure. And then um, we got to the point where they weren't showing a preview of the movie at midnight. And I was so incredibly disappointed because I wanted to be, of course, among the first to see it. I just couldn't wait anymore. I was so worried that someone was going to spoil it for me. But then as luck had it, I was working at an insurance company before I was an educator. 
And someone said to me, Dan, Dan, they're having a Star Wars contest and the winner gets tickets to the midnight showing of the Phantom Menace. And I was like, oh my gosh. So we called and we got in, which is kind of a miracle into itself. And the trivia question was, what was the, the working title of Return of the Jedi? And why did they have this code name? And of course, the episode, the title was Blue Harvest Horror Beyond Imagination. I just knew that. And so I said it. I told them the reason they had this title was because they didn't want the press or fans to find where they were filming the, at that time, the final Star Wars film. And they wanted to keep the sets private. So that was their code. And so I won. I went to the midnight showing. And I'm sure I'll talk later about my initial reactions to it. But that was a big one for me because I was going to get to see Star Wars at midnight on, I guess, technically it is the 19th, even though it feels like the 18th because you're still up all day waiting for it. But so that's <laughs> that's kind of the first one for me. Kelly, you have quite a challenge because you've got to hear a lot of exciting memories and reflections, not only for your article, but people who have been speaking with you on Twitter. But what are some, what's a major first memory that jumps out for you about this movie? Um, for Phantom Menace, uh, I was still in college. I was actually finishing up, I think my last, my last semester and a final, one of my last finals fell on the same day. It must've been the 19th or maybe the 18th. Cause we were seeing the, uh, the midnight showing. And so there was no way I could skip a final to go wait in line. <laughs> I thought about it, <laughs> but um, my friends were nice enough to hold my place in line for the entire day. So I was studying in the morning and trying to get through the whole thing with, you know, Phantom Menace on my mind the whole time. So I just flew through the test, flew to the theater and finally got to my spot in the line. And then, and then I was able to go see it at midnight. And so I remember being super excited. I had seen the special editions in the theater and I had remembered how much I had enjoyed just seeing them on the screen. And so I was even more excited to see a new one on the screen. And uh, my family makes fun of me now because ever since then, every time the Star Wars logo comes up on the screen, I cry. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't matter what I'm seeing. It doesn't matter if I'm in a good mood. It's just the moment always overwhelms me. And I'm pretty sure that's probably when it started. Um, so we watched watched it at midnight uh, I went home, crashed, woke up, and we saw the 10 a.m. showing the next morning. That's the only time I've ever seen a movie, probably two times in a row like that. So, Oh, yeah. that's great. Well, now yeah. i got to ask the question that everyone is wondering right now who's listening. <laughs> did you pass the test? I did. I passed the class. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Ryder, what about you? What's the first memory that kind of jumps into your mind? Well, yeah, I was still in college too, and I can remember. I think we're all this around the same. Yeah, age. probably about that. Yeah, this yeah. I, I, I graduated that same month, or maybe the, you know first week of June. But um, I remember just not knowing what to expect because when Return of the Jedi came out, I mean, my parents bought tickets and we just went, and it just was easy. But for this, my sister and I had to get up at like four in the morning to go wait in line at the local theater because there was no online ticket sales at the time and it was like we were just waiting hoping to get um, any tickets at all and we ended up getting getting them for like 1 30 on the 19th or something like that and um, I could just remember like that's all I could think about when I was in class or taking finals or whatever I get to see another Star Wars movie a new Star Wars movie on the big screen and there was all the hype all the merchandise and I just couldn't get enough of it and you know, I like you guys, I'd grown up with Star Wars and had friends that loved Star Wars. But for some reason, I was the only one that really stuck with the Star Wars. Um, and so um, it was just like super exciting for me. And none of my friends really understood what was going on or, you know, why I was so excited. But I just remember that was a big time in my life, graduating college. And I was moving to uh, to go to dental school a few months later. And I just couldn't get enough of the Phantom Menace that summer. And I, I didn't know that people didn't like it. I, I thought that was an amazing movie. Um, it was just cool to see Star Wars and all the characters and, you know, see younger characters that we already knew and um, just really exciting time. That now, so that kind of reminds me of the next one that I was going to talk about. And that was my first kind of 36 hours with this movie. I've, met, I've told this many times on the show over the years, but basically when I saw it, I remember going into the theater 
And, you know, there was this was the first time, by the way, that I saw people in the 501st. But that's kind of around when the 501st started anyway. Hmm. So that makes sense. And I remember thinking, wow, look at that costume. I wonder if if that's an actor or if that guy made his own costume. I had no idea. And so we're getting in line and people are getting popcorn and everyone's kind of got this nervous ang- anxiety. You, you both know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Before you're about to see a Star Wars movie in the theater, you feel nervous, which is kind of funny because it's not like we made the movie or we have anything, <laughs> you know, financially invested. But we just, you know, it's it's so important to us. And I remember someone behind the counter who was selling popcorn saying to her friend, it's just a movie, my goodness. And I thought, Mm -hmm. just a movie? What's going on here? (laughs) So, you know, your hype can't get any higher. And then it starts, and the scroll opens up, and then I see this text that I'm not familiar with at all. Because right now, the three of us could probably recite the original text for all episodes four, five, and six, no problem. But for me, whenever I see a new Star Wars film and I see something new, it always kind of throws me at first because, well, this yeah. is new. This is exciting, but I'm not, I don't instantly know it by heart already. What's going on? That would be called fan anxiety, ladies and gentlemen. And so then we, I watched it and it was over. And I certainly had a, a, a myriad of emotions during it. And the person I was with turned to me and said, Well, did you like it? And I didn't say anything. And we went to the car and we, I got in the car and put on my seatbelt and I said, I don't know if I liked it. And I was just so, kind of hit by that and I couldn't quite figure out why so I really was marinating on it and I stayed up most of the night just kind of thinking about oh my gosh I like this but I'm not sure about that and why did this happen so I I finally fell asleep and for me to not fall asleep is is really surprising I could probably fall asleep (laughs) in a typhoon because I just you know it's just (laughs) when it's time I'm out but so I woke up the next morning and I looked at, at the wall and I thought what am I doing here? What what am I getting so worked up about? Let's think about this. So then I started thinking about Qui-Gon Jinn. I started thinking about Darth Maul. And I started thinking about seeing Obi-Wan and Anakin me for the first time. And the excitement of going back to Tatooine and the thrill of the pod race. And I thought, you know what? That's great. I I just need to just relax and go in and see it a second time. So, of course, uh, similar to you, Kill, I think I went like at 10 or 11 that next morning. And then that night, I went again at 6 o'clock at night. Uh, to, to take my mom and my brother to it. So I saw it three times in less than 24 hours. A- halfway through the second showing, I thought, oh my gosh, I don't know what was wrong with me. I am so happy. I love this thing. I ended up seeing it, I think, 12 times in the theater on its opening run. That is definitely the last time I saw a movie that many times in the theater. And the very last time I saw it was at a drive-in theater, which is kind of cool because the very first time I saw the original Star Wars, was also at a drive-in theater. So that's kind of my little book and experience there. That is cool. Yeah. Kelly, what about you? What else jumps to mind? Um, so I think I remember parts of the movie having sort of the same feeling. I think I like this, but at the, at the same time I knew. So obviously it was, I think it was maybe Jar Jar where I was kind of thinking, do I like this? And then I had the realization during the movie, don't forget this is for kids. And so once (laughs) I kind of talked to myself into that, just like you, just to relax, then I think I really started to enjoy it a lot more. The, The only thing I would think that was negative for me with Phantom Menace was so much of it felt like I had seen it before because I had watched the trailers over and over. And so every time there there was a line from the trailer, I'd, I'd say, oh, I remember that part. Oh, I remember that part. And then speaking of Qui-Gon, I had had his fate spoiled thanks to the soundtrack. And then they yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that those experiences kind of feeling like I had overdone it before I'd even seen the movie. And again, that affect me you know, even now where I try to avoid spoilers, I think that's why I feel so strongly about them. And I, sometimes I even avoid, you know, trailers if I, if I can. So it was a positive experience overall, but yeah, there were definitely some moments where I was, had a little bit of regret. So you're in good company here because of course on coffee with Kenobi, we are very anti-spoiler. I, I, I completely agree with you. I remember sitting in my, my mom's, my mom had a condo. And I'd gone to visit her and I was leaving her, her condo complex. And I had the, the soundtrack on the seat next to me. And I was purposely avoiding looking at the tracks for some reason, uh, because I just wanted to just, 
I for me, like the same thing when when I first saw Hamilton. I didn't listen to anything until I see it for the mm-hmm. first time because I want to experience it all boom fresh from from the get-go. But for some reason I I pulled over before I actually pulled onto the street and I held up the CD. I looked at the back and I read the track for the Phantom Menace. So I think Kelly, <laughs> uh, Ryder, and I certainly empathize with you because I, yeah. remember, I remember saying out loud, "What? Yeah, I work so hard <laughs> to avoid this." <laughs> Can you both imagine what it would have been like if we had social media when the Phantom oh. Menace came out? No. Uh, can you imagine if they had a title on the uh, Last Jedi soundtrack that said Luke Skywalker's death or something? Oh. You know. I just, I, it blows my mind that they had that title on that sound. But I had the same thing. I bought, I bought the CD and I walked out to my car, read it, and I thought, holy cow, I can't believe that's on there. So yeah. <laughs> I, that may have been when I started hating spoilers and not looking into them anymore. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So, uh, Kelly, real quick, because um, I want to get the writer's next memory too. You mentioned Jar Jar. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I like that you had a, it was a really prescient comment that moment that you had where you're like, no, this is for kids. And that, that, I think that's important. That realization didn't hit me. I actually, now that I think about it, Jar Jar, while he was a little bit, I was a little, he's a little bit grating at first. Now I love him. But mm-hmm. at first I wasn't so sure. The thing that bothered me is I thought Tatooine took too long. I thought there was too much of a drag to it. But, but I also, when I went back to it, then I just enjoyed the dance of the narrative and, and the, the slow build of what it was going to take to get Anakin to go from Tatooine to Coruscant. And then it became really, really wonderful for me. Mm-hmm. But, but and, and as I've said many times before as well, the thing about Jar Jar that fascinates me, uh, the first time my kids saw it, they loved it. And they still think fondly of Jar Jar. They think of him kind of like the Three Stooges or something. And they giggle, even, you know, as teenagers now, they laugh when he does things. My students love Jar Jar. No one complains about Jar Jar. I think that was just sort of, um, there was a mixed bag of of people out there who just, I don't know what they were expecting, but uh, Jar Jar stood this test of time. And I clearly Celebration Chicago uh, proved that with the warm reception for Ahmad Best. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I remember at the time, and, and I, I will have this quote totally wrong, but George Lucas said something um, to the effect that you may not like Jar Jar or you may love Jar Jar, but Jar Jar, but nobody argues that he doesn't look like he fits into the movie. He doesn't look fake when he's on the screen. And George Lucas thought that was a success, which it was. And it didn't look completely CGI like like he you know pretty much was. Well, Kelly, he was he, Jar Jar. The creation of Jar Jar was really groundbreaking, wasn't it? Um, yeah, he wasn't the, um, I don't think he was the first completely CG character. Um, and I learned while I was doing research for a different article for StarWars.com that they actually worked on, I think, Watto first. Uh, I read I read a book on the making of episode one, and uh, I think they had uh, some work on Watto done, and then they started on Jar Jar. Wow. But as a... As a performer, I think it's hard not to appreciate what Ahmed Best did with his whole body and the way that he really just threw himself entirely into that into the role. Yeah, it certainly has resonated with with people for well, gosh, for twenty years, I guess, hasn't it? Writer, uh, our writer, what's the next memory you have of the Phantom Menace? Well, I remember going home and just wanting to rewatch the original trilogy because I felt like. The Phantom Menace added so much to that original trilogy with the interactions between Anakin and Obi Wan. I wanted to go back and and watch Obi Wan tell Luke, you know, how Darth Vader killed his father, and I thought Obi Wan's a straight up liar. And you know, all these you really thought that. Well, no, I didn't really think that he was a straight up liar, but I, <laughs> <laughs> but I thought he's fudging the truth a little bit. And then I wanted to hear Yoda and Luke on Dagobah talk about. Uh, Luke's powerful Jedi father and I just felt like I wanted to see anything in the original trilogy that may have been alluded to in the Phantom Menace and I just felt like that added so much to the to the story of the original trilogy Um, and I I just could not I I, I guess I didn't have the same feelings after seeing the, the Phantom Menace that you guys did I I just expected to love Star Wars and I didn't know that anybody could hate a Star Wars movie at the time (laughs) <laughs> and obviously my feelings of my understanding has changed on that nowadays. But um, I came out and I just 
couldn't stop thinking about it and thinking about Anakin, this innocent little boy who's going to turn into this killer. And I, I thought Obi-Wan was so awesome when he was younger and, and obviously he was cool when Alec Guinness portrayed him too, but I just loved how Ewan McGregor portrayed him. And then what we saw done with a lightsaber, you know, Qui-Gon s- stabs his lightsaber through the blast door. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought that is amazing because we've never seen Jedi act like this. We've never really seen Jedi on the screen um, fighting like that. And it was just mind blowing to me. And I just, I, I loved it. You're yeah, making me watch it again right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, right? That opening sequence with with the Jedi's in their prime, and as you said, cutting through the those blast doors, and just that thrill, and then them zipping through really, really quickly. The first mm-hmm. time I showed it to my son, who's five now, he looked at me and said, "Daddy, they're like the Flash." I said, "Exactly, <laughs> they're fast." Yeah, it was uh-huh. that was really thrilling because we we'd of course heard that, and we got to see Luke do some incredible stuff in Return of the Jedi, but it had only been, you know, stories and legends and comic books and things since 1983. So we finally get to that place and we're, we're stunned by what happened. I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and take a break. And now let's see what's brewing in the Star Wars universe this week. Oh, wait, this is interesting. You found something. I'm about to let everyone in on the secret. That new segment you just heard is not exactly new. That is the one that Corey and I used to use before Corey turned off the microphone and we switched <laughs> over to the newer format. But it's so perfect because I was trying to think about what's the way I can bring Tom in and not necessarily use music. So this is great. Tom, uh, welcome back to the show. Of course. Uh, what do you got for us this week? Oh, boy. Let me tell you, May 22nd was a big day for the rise of Skywalker News. And Chris from Lucas, Lucasfilm Publicity hammered out the new news of the day in a tweet as Lev Grossman's Vanity Fair article hit the Internet. Now, here's a list of what uh, Chris put out there, and we'll break it down. A couple actor announcements. Carrie Russell will be playing Zori Bliss, and Richard E. Grant plays Allegiant General Pride. And a couple of new planets are named and given inhabitants. The new snow planet is Kajini, and the planet Pasana's inhabitants are called Akiaki. We see Finn and a new character, Jana, played by Naomi Aki, ride horse-like orbacks into battle, and the Knights of Ren are back. There's so much here in this little Skywalker grocery list, so what interests you? Well, first of all, kudos to you for pronouncing those things like they are second nature, because this is very, very new. <laughs> <laughs> and very, very exciting. So, uh, my gosh, I mean, I think the Richard Grant image is what jumps out to me immediately. Uh, yeah. It's just Allegiant General Pride. Now, this is not um, the father, right? This is not the father of um, our favorite redheaded evil uh, oh. r- resistance leader, um, General Hux. Um, but we don't know who he is or how he's related, but, boy, does he look the part. He looks mean and cantankerous and not like someone that you would mess with it'd be interesting to see what he does i mean seeing carrie russell's costume and the fact that we have a name zori bliss is is really cool uh it is kind of nice to see that the desert planet is not tatooine and it's not jakku so we've got something new i mean star wars has more planets uh (laughs) my goodness i mean indeed are we ever going to throw up our flag and say okay i think we've we've mapped out the known world columbus (laughs) <laughs> we've got we've got a lot of them to keep track of. It's almost impossible. Fortunately, they have uh, great uh, source books that do that. But those are the main ones. I do like those Orbacks. Sometimes the new creatures are hit and miss for me. Mm-hmm. But this one is uh, – that one looks really, really nice. Uh, I'm excited the Knights and Runner back. Uh, I know you and I talked about this uh, at school, so I'll let you uh, say first on the show what kind of your opinion of the Knights of Run. Oh, um, yeah, I, I was really excited to see that picture because I've I've always wondered since The Force Awakens, who are the Knights of Ren and, and what, what who like what do they do? And looking at this image, um, I, I really feel like they they don't fit what my image was uh, going to be. They look a lot a lot more. Oh, mercenary like than what I was expecting. And they look a lot more classical or classic. As I look at them, I see weapons from that I would expect almost in like, I don't know, a fantasy novel. I see a mace and some kind of a, a pickaxe and a, and a large thick blade that like, like almost Thanos carries and just 
it wasn't what I was quite expecting. But you know what? Kylo Ren, he's he's a unique guy, and he is not uh, old order as much as he wants to go after uh, you know chases after the dream of uh, Vader. And so I don't know. I think that that it, that is a really neat addition to. Um, to kind of what I was imagining uh, this to look like, um, and I am I am with you 100% on the uh, the first order image with allegiant general pride. Doesn't that just add a level of like dominance uh, yeah, with the title really of allegiant? And they just I mean I look at that photo and it's a little scary. It is um, as as it me look like an actor, yeah. Yeah, and they've they've they played up uh, General Hux to be kind of a fool in the last movie, as you know when when Poe was having that wordplay with him at the beginning before he attacked the dreadnought, and kind of made him look foolish. This is not the same Hux. At least it doesn't feel like the same Hux. Much more evil and menacing, especially with that allegiant general pride sitting right in front of him. The and I like that the pride is spelled P R Y D E, so it's sort of a pun, um, a play on words. Uh, the Knights of Ren, to me, I expected to see individuals that looked more in the style of Kylo Ren, but they just look kind of like desert thugs or pirates. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't expect that. Of course, it's it's one image. You certainly can't base an entire nope. decision on one image, but it's very intriguing. Um, oh gosh, I don't really know what to say without uh, breaking my normal tradition of what I do and do say, but. I'm I'm very excited by this. I'm not going to say encouraged because I've always been very optimistic about the rise of Skywalker. Mm-hmm. I just like getting more information, but I'm good for a long time. I don't I don't need any more trailers. I don't need any more information. I'm just going to wait and then go get my popcorn and stay in line for the movie. Of oh, course, man, you know there's going to be a lot more. <laughs> But it's Can't wait cool. for that. But yeah. hey, let's we'll talk about the photos uh, in just a bit. But let's talk a little bit about this um, this Vanity Fair article that I mentioned. Sure. The cover story to the 2019 summer issue of Vanity Fair was presented online on May 22nd, and the article by Lev Grossman gives up gives an up close look at the production of the Rise of Skywalker, as well as some character pro- character and actor profiles, and does some deep analysis of 40 years of Star Wars as a reflection of society. The article opens with the importance of of the story being filmed on location in Jordan's Valley of the Moon. Besides the beauty of this unique location, Oscar Isaac says that filming on location creates an imperfection that one can't create in the studio. Isaac says, quote, the imperfections that you have in these environments immediately create a sense of authenticity. You just believe it more. Now, this is part of what has made the second and third trilogy so authentic. And as we know, Lucasfilm Tatooine in Tunisia way back in 1977. And the elements such as oh, the, the, the heat and the sandstorms make it real for the actors. And that translates to the big screen. The article later turns its attention to Anthony Daniels' character, C-3PO, who has appeared in all nine films. Daniels interestingly reveals the first line, his first line of the film, and discusses how he just couldn't memorize his part until the last minute before filming. Daniels says that his first line is, common emblem. <laughs> well, I tried. <laughs> but that would not go into his head, and he practiced it over and over, and his wife would say it back with him. Grossman also covers the characters of Lando Calrissian, Chewbacca, Finn, and there are hints that the Force connection between Rey and Kylo Ren run deeper than we thought. Abrams discusses the difficulty of telling the story uh, without the late Carrie Fisher. Abrams shared that a digital Carrie Fisher would not do the job and there was no way Lucasfilm was going to recast the role. So Abrams remembered unused footage from The Force Awakens and he admits, quote, it was hard to even talk about without sounding like being some kind of cosmic goofball. But he suddenly realized that the impossible answer to the impossible question could be answered in the unused footage. Uh, There's so much more to talk about in this article, so be sure to check out the link on Coffee with Kenobi website to uh, have access to the full Vanity Fair article. The only thing I really want to address, uh, you brought up something that I was that I was not going to bring up, but since you did, I will, I'll talk about it. Mm-hmm. Now, the 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 tease there about Ray and Kylo Ren has brought out the Raylo hashtags um, to a to another level, really. Mm. Um, this is the only I'm going to say about this. I think the last time I talked about it was maybe on the last Jedi review show. 
I think, and maybe we'll replay this later in December, and we'll just um, we'll keep track of the timestamp so we can record my, <laughs> replay my audio. <laughs> but if Ray and Kylo Ren somehow end up becoming something romantic, I would think that would be extremely upsetting and disappointing because she watched this man, Kylo Ren, murder not only his father but someone who she very much considered like a mentor mm-hmm. figure. So if she were that. Uh, disturbed that she would decide that she was in love with someone who murdered someone she cared so deeply about. That would be therapy, um, a lifetime's worth of therapy, I would think. I think Ray is healthy and balanced. And I think, I don't think someone balanced would want to date or be with someone who murdered someone that she cared about. Hmm. Well, I have my theories, but as as the premise of this show goes, I'm just going to pack that theory away until December, and I will tam- time stamp it in my own file. Did and, I ruin? Did I ruin our our and, policy? No. Oh, no, no, no. I don't think you did at all. But uh, mm-hmm. but but what I would want to say would, and so oh, um, okay, because I definitely have a a very solid feeling of of what this connection could potentially be and but it's it's just my own belief and i've got i've i can base it on things um but i don't want to go there and and i'll share that in what seven months yeah so i guess let's well, just not talk until then is that we'll just walk by and smile we can hang uh, and, be and stuff like that but then just i'm afraid you might say it Oh no, it's locked. I've got it. I've got <laughs> it's to in put the vault, Jerry. I've got to put away. It's in a vault, Jerry. That's right. <laughs> you know what I found really, uh, really engaging in this article. Um, besides, I mean, really, kind of the whole thing um, was, and I didn't really talk about it too much. I just mentioned it in my intro to that story. Is is Grossman does this phenomenal job of talking about how Star Wars has traditionally reflected the society, you know, the, the times that they were, that it was filmed and how in the 1970s there was a, there was an innocence. Um, and, and we, we were, and Kathleen Kennedy mentions that we were able to, you know, be afraid of Vader, but at the same time, consider him kind of a hero or, or, a, or we could like him because he was cool. But in the times that we live in today, that this, this, I'm looking at this image right now of Hux and, um, and pride and thinking about Vader and the influences that he has. And it's so different in our times in 2019 and, and these characters and these, uh, themes are so much more relevant to us today. And he goes into this, he, he kind of concludes the article with this idea of, of the reflection of how, how Star Wars has remained the same, but at the same time, it is, it is very different because of the times. It's really interesting. And I, I find that stuff to be fascinating. I, oh, I did too. I, I think we could spend an entire month of shows on just that concept. Yeah, I think it's it's really neat, and I encourage anyone who hasn't read the article already to check it out. Um, not only for the article, but let's talk a little bit about the photos that go along with that. Are you ready to move on? Let's do it. Now that we haven't, or now we haven't discussed the phenomenal photography yet of uh, included with the article by world famous and legendary photographer Annie Leibovitz. The article is riddled with amazing set shots. But also includes the two covers of the spring issue. Ray is on one cover, Kylo Ren is on the other, and it appears that if you slide the two covers together, that they could create one image with Kylo Ren on the left and Ray on the right. Or, as my daughter pointed out, I think you could even flip flop those, and they still match into one image. Oh, I don't true. know. Take a look at them and see how see if they fit together. But the images we find: uh, the Knights of Ren. On set with J.J. Abrams and stunt coordinator Eunice Huthart, a first look at Carrie Russell's masked scoundrel character Zori Bliss, a very menacing, as we've already discussed, uh, look at First Order leader, leaders General Hawks and Allegiant General Pride, played by Domhnall Gleeson and Richard E. Grant, a heroic look at the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon with Poe Dameron, Lando Calrissian, Chewbacca, BB-8, and newcomer Dio, and a beautiful look at John Williams conducting the Star Wars score with an image of Carrie Fisher as General Organa in the background of the studio. And there are several others that I did not mention. So, Dan, which image struck you? Well, I mean, it's, it's a... Hmm, I, I, the, the one that I used for the web post at the top was one of Lando and the Falcon. Billy Dee Williams looks incredible. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, really incredible. Oscar Isaac is pulling in Eunice with Tomo Zutomo as Chewbacca. That one's pretty gorgeous. I mean, that is definitely a showcase for them. It's a showcase for for Andy Leibovitz's talents as a photographer. The um, the image that you didn't mention, the one of Mark Hamill, that yes. is a stunner. <laughs> that is an incredibly powerful one. Uh, our buddy uh, Jason Fry, uh, author Jason Fry, huh? he's been raving about that one on Twitter today as well. Um, my goodness. I mean, you could easily spend a lot of time on each one. The ones, uh, the one with with Finn, uh, and well, who's another other new character? I can't think of her name all of a sudden. Uh, Jana, Jana, yeah, those that's a pretty great one. I love those, I love the look of those, those horse style creatures uh-huh. quite a bit. What about you? Um, well, I really am kind of, I've been enjoying, well, the Falcon one definitely, that's probably the top one for me. I just, I love that one. Um, and I also have always enjoyed set photos, um, just to see the kind of the behind the scenes and, and you see the actor or actress in pose, but then you see everything that's in right directly in their face in front of them and how there's a whole army of crew, uh, while they appear to be very isolated, but probably the photo that, um, that has really been standing out to me as I've uh, been looking at it throughout the day is the, the stunning photo of Ray and Kylo Ren on this watery battle that I think is so interesting as juxtaposed to the Jedi sterile, um, sterile environment that they that they fought together on in the last jedi in snoke's um throne room and so you put those two together and and it's it's very different and i'm sure it's going to be very symbolic in some way but i'm going to take the photo as it is and just love the look of it this the, the lightsaber shining and the action shot that it is and just enjoy that yeah, I, I don't know a lot about photography. I don't know a lot about lighting. That's for sure. All you need to do is look at my pictures on Instagram, and you can tell I have no clue what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but I know when I'm looking at it that it's that it's incredibly high quality, which sounds uh-huh. like, it sounds like saying, well, that Michael Jordan was pretty good at the basketball. Of course, Nina <laughs> Leibovitz is great, yeah, a great photographer. But this is a, a wonderful showcase for her and the incredible canvas that we have that JJ is working with. Man. Nah, it really uh, kind of wet the whistle in ways I didn't expect. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So be sure to check all those photos out. That's going to keep us busy for quite some time. And Dan, I just wanted to do a quick mention before we sign off on the news that the Oculus Quest Vader Immortal released this week. And if you want to know more about that, Dan, you and I, along with Corey Club and Clayton Sandell, we experienced that at Star Wars Celebration. So check out our recorded reactions to that story experience in our Star Wars Celebration kind of collection of uh, shows that we did uh, back in April. And I also interviewed some of the creators of this, including the director, and got some insights in the creation of this. And it's incredible. I mean, my goodness, it was one of the highlights of Celebration. If you get your hands on one of these things, you are in for an incredible, incredible experience. Because it is an experience. It's very much more than a game. It, It is absolutely an experience. As is having you on each and every week for the news, Mr. Gross. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's always my pleasure. Oh, it's our pleasure as well to to hear your enthusiasm and your information. So, so cool. Let's go ahead and take our break. When we come back, we will continue our conversation about memories we have of Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. This is Coffee with Kenobi. Greetings. This is Obi-Wan Kenobi, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. I'd love to take a chance to share with you the awesome things going on on our CWK Patreon page. But before that, I'd like to thank our CWK Patreon contributors. Jason Hall, Rebecca Raven, Dennis Keithley, Ross, Frank Mulder, Alexander Moylan, Ben Elkington, Melinda Wolf, Aaron Harris, Chris Gavarka, Angela Sauce, Mediocre Jedi, Sean Reed, Kurt McKellen, Yancey Evans, Dan Ream, Colby Mead, Brian Harding, Blake Weaver, Chris Hamm, Jim Capron, Caroline Maselli, Chris Metz, LJ Souter, Thea Selby, Jeff Ellis, Daz Davies, Christian Dale, 
Brian McKinney, Connie Shee, Jared Cantor, BJ Smith, Eric Struthers, Nick Deco, and Mark Suter. Coffee with Kenobi Patreon contributors donate once a month to our show and they get access to CWK Pour Over, which is our weekly podcast where we talk about popular culture topics. Of course, we talk about Star Wars, but we also talk about Marvel, DC, films, the Disney theme parks, Universal theme parks, what's going on in our lives, and of course, behind the scenes of Coffee with Kenobi. I can say that next week I will be going to an exclusive event to celebrate the opening of Galaxy's Edge in Disneyland in Anaheim, California. And there will be a ton of extra behind-the-scenes stuff on CWK Prover, especially through our lens, which is the CWK Patreon feature. It's just kind of like Instagram or Snapchat, where I can record different messages and show you pictures that only you will get a chance to see, and those are for contributors of $10 or more a month. A lot of great things happening. You can also get t-shirts, coffee mugs, and so much more. And your contributions help the show with travel, with the expenses of running the website, uh, trying to give you the best quality on the sound of the podcast, and so many more other things. Coffee with Kenobi is a wonderful podcast. I have a blast doing, but it certainly is uh, a lot of work. And that is, believe me, a labor of love. And one of the ways you're able to help me make that happen is through your generous Patreon contributions. And I thank you so very much. If you have any questions, please let me know. You can email me or send me a tweet or a DM or whatever you'd like to tell me about where I can give you the best that Patreon has to offer through Coffee with Kenobi. Thank you so much. Go to www.patreon.com slash coffee with Kenobi to check out everything and sign up to help out the show today. Speaking of going to Galaxy's Edge and Batu next week, MEI and Mouse Fan Travel is how I recommend you book your destination vacation to Disneyland or later in August at Walt Disney World if you want to experience Galaxy's Edge and Batu. Think about it. A Star Wars land, 14 acres in Disney World and Disneyland. It's happening. It's real. It opens next week. And you should sign up for a no-obligation, no-cost quote when you use MEI and try to figure out how you can get there, and I think you're not going to regret it. MEI has signature service and expert advice to help clients maximize their vacation time and dollar. As I just mentioned, they have a no-cost, no-obligation quote for when you use their service, and they also proactively adjust a booking if the rate goes down, which is amazing. They will help your family enjoy everything the Disney theme parks and the cruise lines have to offer, help plan every detail, and share invaluable tips. Be sure to go to our affiliate link, which can be found on the show notes, on the front of our webpage, or on our Twitter feed, and sign up for a free, no-obligation quote. We're back, and as I reflect on the beginning of the show, I'm thinking, okay, maybe I should have booked Kelly and Ryder for about four weeks in a row, because <laughs> we barely scratched the surface of this thing, honestly. Um, Kelly, why don't we start with you for, for the second half of the show? Uh Kind of more things to stand out to you about. Um, probably you can't really talk about the Phantom Menace with talk, without talking about uh, the costuming, especially on uh, Queen Amidala. I don't know if any other Star Wars can say they've matched that since then, but I, it's almost impossible not to think of that, I guess, when I think about what I love about the movie. Did you go and see any of the costumes on display when they had the traveling exhibits? I did. I think it actually, so the I think it was called the Power of Costumes or something similar. They actually yeah. had their first stop here in Seattle. So I had a, a press invite to go check out the exhibit. So it was a very, it was a wonderful experience because it was a closed room before they opened and I got to look around uh, and you could see her dresses up close um, on the mannequins and it, it was just amazing. It made you appreciate so much more. I remember the... Um, the lace details on her wedding dress were just gorgeous in person. The, you just can't imagine it until you see it in person. You know, I got invited to go to that. I think it was in Cleveland. Does that sound right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it toured all over, I think. Yeah, and I couldn't go because we were, well, I was teaching. And I, and I'd, I'd use all my my time off already, so I couldn't make it. And I was so bummed because I, I would have liked to have gotten to that private area, too. But it did tour for a while. I think it's done now, unfortunately. But 
that is one thing. And I think uh, Queen Shadow is, is shows that really, really nicely too. kind of the power. Uh, she's a strong, powerful woman and her costumes very much reflect that. And even now, when you look back 20 years later, they, they still are very much, they feel like they're fresh, like a fresh design. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It does. Yeah. Which I think is really, really incredible. Uh, Ryder, what's another memory that you have? Well, I got to say Darth Maul, because when we saw that double bladed lightsaber ignite, I just thought, my gosh, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I love the scene in the hangar on Naboo when Queen when uh, Queen Amidala and the Jedi and, and some of the troops are walking and and the door opens and Darth Maul's standing right there. And she says, we'll we'll go around or we'll take the other way. And and Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan just step up like, let's do this. And I just. Darth Maul was like the epitome of evil and hearing him say in the trailer that, you know, at last we'll reveal our, our, reveal ourselves to the Jedi at last we'll have revenge. And I just had always wondered what does, you know, what is going to happen in this movie? And then seeing him fight against two Jedi in their, mostly in their primes. And it was just, it was awesome. And mm-hmm. it kind of reminded me of when we saw Kylo Ren ignite his lightsaber in the force awakens teaser trailer. And it's like, this is something new and star Wars just kind of keeps reinventing itself and having just cool stuff on the screen. And yeah, I think we do need to talk about that, that trailer, that, that first trailer, that teaser trailer very well might be the coolest trailer ever made Mm -hmm. for any movie period. The hype for that thing. I first saw it on entertainment tonight and we recorded it (laughs) and I watched it so many times. I know I'm sure we all did. Uh, because this is before the internet, boys and girls, before yeah. it's really the force that it is now. And just that that speculation. I, and then I, I believe it was in, I don't remember where it was published, but they said that creature or that character with a red double-bladed lightsaber, his name is Darth Maul. And I thought, oh, wow. So this is like the first Darth Vader, is that at least that's what I thought at the time. Um, which led, of course, to a flood of merchandise and that's one of the really the next memory that i have with this movie and i wrote down taco bell pizza hut and pepsi (laughs) (laughs) so pepsi of course i believe Uh, pepsi i don't know if pepsi owns taco bell and pizza Hut or how that works but they all work in in partnership with each other and where i live when i was growing up then uh taco bell and pizza hut were like a block from each other so literally almost every day or every other day I would go to Taco Bell or Pizza Hut. In fact, I have, I'm looking at it right now in my studio, I have a Star Wars Episode One Taco Bell hat that employees wore. Nice. Be- because somebody, there was one like uh, in the background, and I said to an employee, hey, uh, is that for people who work here? He said, yeah. And I said, can I buy that? He goes, no, you can just have it. So he just gave it to me. I'm like, sweet. Yeah. I've got a little thing. Then at Pizza Hut, because they had like, uh, I don't remember how many different collectibles that they had, but they had like, Little Rubik's Cubes and miniature Naboo Starfighters and different Queen Amidala items. They had a new Gunray Spider Throne that he was on that you wind up and it would walk. Mm-hmm. They had all these great things. And then the Pizza Hut boxes had the Star Wars characters on the Pizza Hut boxes. And I saved one of my boxes. And then uh, like a year later, I found it and it was just covered in grease. I thought, why did I do this? <laughs> because it had Star Wars on it. I think that one had Queen Amidala on it. I just thought it was so cool. They really went overboard with it. And I know that that's kind of been something that people have scrutinized over the years. But I loved it. I mean, the the hype for that, as you mentioned earlier in the show, Kelly, was just so wonderful and so exciting. And, and for me, you know, you've got three ways to experience something. You've got the anticipation the moment and the memory and i think the anticipation is perhaps the most thrilling part of that and that merchandise and that merchandise push for it certainly added to my enjoyment of the film yeah the merchandise is the thing that i remember just getting everything that i possibly could i remember trying to talk friends or my family into going to taco bell all the time and getting those like drink toppers and all kinds of stuff and when the when the action figures or all the toys came out when they went on sale, I had like a final the next day. So I talked my sister into stopping at, at Toys R Us to wait in line until midnight or whenever they went on sale to buy them for me. I think I gave her like a hundred dollars. And thinking I've got to get to sleep. I've got to get to sleep. But I couldn't wait till she got home with all these new action figures. And I thought, oh my gosh, that is so cool because 
the most recent ones I think had been like the power of the force action figures and they weren't yep. quite what I liked, but seeing all these new characters um, in action figure form was just so exciting. Oh, it was great. Kelly, did you buy the action figures too? So I didn't, like I said, I was a college student and I was living in a dorm, so I didn't have a lot of space or money, but uh, now I wish, of course, that I had bought way more. But the one thing that I had bought was that first one sheet with uh, Jake Lloyd and the Shadow of Darth Vader. Mm, yes. That hung in my, mm. my next apartment and after that for I don't know how many years. That was just such a striking image. I had to have it. That is my my favorite movie poster, I think, of all time. I still have that hanging in my basement frame right now. It is just oh, wow. so cool. I And even my wife loves that, and my mom loves it. It's like everybody loves that poster. It's just such a cool poster. It's beautiful. I, yeah. I actually have that poster, too. Wow, the three of us should start a club. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a lot of stuff in common. Yeah, that, that, that was such a great image because you've got that wonderful, the shadowy reflection of Vader, yeah. you know, above this little boy. Which was very, very powerful. Kelly, what other memories do you have of the Phantom Menace? Um, I can't say anything else sticks out too much. I do know that I've I've tried not to let myself be too influenced, maybe by the uh, the the harsher feedback over the years. I think there were so there were some times I think where it started to get to me, where I started to question, do I really like? This movie is that is that kind of weird, but you know I think I've held on to it for a really long time because I really did just really love it. Um, unlike most people, I think I would probably put it in my top three of Star Wars. Oh, that's great! That's awesome. <laughs> I think uh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I've I've held on. I think I don't. I'm not sure. You know. Well, how about this? What what is it that put it over the top for you? Because Again, your your passion and enthusiasm through all your wonderful articles over the past couple of weeks about the Phantom Menace have really been exciting to me. So, what was it that kind of put it over the top for you? Um, I mean, there's always the nostalgia, the memories, but I think even at the time, I appreciated how far they were pushing the technology to make to tell a good story. Um, and I think that might be why it's always stuck with me. And I think actually Star Wars in general that they kept, he, George Lucas in particular, kept pushing what he could do to tell the story that he, you know, that he always wanted to tell. Uh, so I think that's part of what always uh, has appealed to me about The Phantom Menace. And like you guys said, seeing the Jedi in action the way that, you know, we'd always dreamed of, that will always stay with me. It's funny, Ryder, you mentioned the part where uh, Padme says, we'll take the long way. Yeah. Cause that's my favorite part in the movie. Oh. And I stand up every time because <laughs> I'm ready to watch. That's the cool. now. <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, all those things are the reason why that movie's always stayed uh, near to my heart. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's still the goosebump moment for me. Yeah. That, I, I've got them right now. Yeah. <laughs> sequence, because you, you hear the slow build of, of John Williams is do all the fates. Yeah. And you just know it's going to happen. I mean, it's just a perfect showdown that unlike really unlike anything that we've seen in Star Wars before or since, because it very much was sort of like these two powerful Jedi, almost like old West gunslingers and the door sides open and you see this, this epitome of evil. I spent a long time um, thinking about what it meant that there was a Phantom Menace. And for a while I thought Darth Maul's the Phantom Menace because you don't see him very much. He's almost like a ghost or a shadow or a specter until the very, very end. Um, I always liked, by the way, that he was used sparingly in this movie. Yes. I think that adds to the power of him. I think that's why Boba Fett was successful in The Empire Strikes Back, because that mystery, that the less, the kind of the less is more aspect of this, I think very much added to the mystique of Darth Maul. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah, I he only had, what, a, a couple of lines, but it made him seem tougher and mysterious. And we wanted to know more about him. We don't have a, the, we didn't have the entire backstory that everyone always needs to have. And, um, and it's just cool. I think uh, that might be part of the appeal of Snoke is everybody keeps t saying they want this backstory on him, but I'm not sure we really do. I think a little mystery is okay in our villains and in our heroes, I think. Oh, I agree. And for the record, I don't want to back. I don't want any background on Snoke. I think no. he's fine the way he yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's, yeah. I agree. 
Ryder, anything else before we wrap up about Phantom Menace you want to say? Well, I, this was actually the first movie that I ever went and saw by myself. And it, I, I can't remember if it came back into the theaters like in two, in the year 2000 or if it would still be in the theaters. But I was in Milwaukee and I, I think I had gotten back from like my Christmas break um, in dental school. And I had to find like this theater that was a, quite a ways away from, from where I lived and I thought, am I going to do this? Am I really going to go to a movie by myself? But I, I've got to see this movie one more time on the big screen. So I like got a backpack ready and like smuggled in a bunch of like beef jerky and treats and took a magazine so I didn't look like some weirdo sitting in the back of the theater and went to the movie by myself. And I thought this, and I hadn't seen it for a couple of months in the theater. And I thought, I got to see if this still holds up. And it's like, oh my gosh, that is still so cool. And um, I, I just remember doing that and I thought I might have a, I might have a star Wars problem if I'm going to a movie by myself, but apparently that's accepted now and it's fine. And I've done it several times since. Well, I love going to movies by myself. Yeah. It's kind of relaxing really. Sure. It is. Did either of you go and see it when it was released in 3d in theaters back in 2010 or 11? Oh yeah, I did. I actually, so this is the, that's the first star Wars movie I took my son to see any of my sons to see. Oh, cool. And it was like one of those things where, Dad, why are you crying? This isn't like a sad part. It's like, no, buddy, it's because I'm sitting here with you watching Star Wars. Oh, man. And it's like super, you know, that's like emotional to me because I never thought I'd get to take my kids to see Star Wars. And so now every time the new movie, movie comes out, we go and then my kids sit there and stare at me because they want to see me cry when it comes <laughs> on the screen. And, uh, you know, whatever. But, <laughs> you know, that I, I did go to that and I, I thought it was I thought it was awesome. And you, Kelly? Uh, no, I didn't. I had, uh, I had a. My daughter was born in two thousand nine, so you know the first couple of years, it's kind of hard to get out <laughs> to the movie theater. <laughs> Very <laughs> true. <Missed it. laughs> oh man! Well, it's um, it was it was cool because that I take my boys to see that too. It was just in my that was the first time my wife had seen a Star Wars movie in theaters too, hmm. and that was just really wonderful just having that moment and that's one of the great things about star wars is it just it does so much for us you know for families and that's why i'm glad that they're going to continue this trend of having star wars movies come out in december because there's already kind of a good family vibe in the air anyway yeah. because of christmas mm -hmm. uh which i think is great the only last thing i want to say about this movie um just for this show uh is and you mentioned this earlier it was toys r us and the action figures that that midnight rush for Star Wars for new action figures and games and collectibles and T-shirts and all kinds of stuff. I was insanely excited. I was already a gigantic Star Wars collector anyway. And the memory, the one of the main memories that stands out about this is when they actually opened the doors and let us run in. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a husband and wife couple grabbed the shopping cart and they got in front of me. They kind of used the cart as a battering ram, quite honestly, <laughs> and got in front of all of us. And they just took their hands and just started taking huge racks of figures and placing yeah. them in the carts yeah. without even looking. I know it was terrible, without even looking at what they were getting or realizing that they had duplicates. I, I still secretly hope every night uh, one of my prayers is that they ended up with all Jar Jars. <laughs> um, <laughs> and but it didn't it didn't really make a difference. I think later they only let them take one or two of each figure, which I thought was totally fair. Because come on, you know you're not going to get rich from doing that. It's it's about enjoying it. There are a lot of kids there who want, just wanted to get a Star Wars action figure of a Jedi Knight or a Stormtrooper, or well, I guess it wouldn't have been a Stormtrooper in that collection, but battle droids or Darth Maul or or Mace Windu or just something like that. So that always stood out to me because when I got home. Like you were saying, you were excited. It was midnight. I just kept looking at these figures. And I, that was the first time I put action figures on my wall uh, with push pins. Yeah. And I put them in such a way that they didn't go through the hole of the card, but the card or the pin would kind of stick them to the wall uh, without putting a hole in the cards. And I would just look at it and just smile because I had more Star Wars figures. And they had that, that gorgeous uh, Darth Maul image at the top left. I'm looking at some of mine right now. And... It just really added, you know, Star Wars and action figures have always they've been a wonderful marriage of how to celebrate this saga. Uh, I mentioned earlier the Pepsi cans. Pepsi did this wonderful thing where 
in cases of Coke or Diet Pepsi, or not, I guess it was always going to wise to Coke, and Pepsi, Diet uh-huh. Pepsi, um, different cans of soda, they would have different uh, images of the characters from the movie. And I was on vacation in Missouri, and you had to get everywhere through with a boat because it was just like a, a lake community, not the Lake Ozarks, but close to there. And so there was this gas station that everybody would go to and you could get a cheeseburger there and all kinds of stuff. And they had this huge cooler full of Pepsi cans. So I would, we went there every day during our vacation and I would just hunt for different Pepsi cans. And finally the people I was with said, why do you like Pepsi so much? (laughs) Well, it's not really that Pepsi's fine, but I really want these cans. And they had specialty ones. They had a gold one and they had a black one and I never got them. I've only seen them at Rancho Obi-Wan. But they, they were always sort of like holy grails for us because you never knew if you were going to get them in a 12-pack or not. But that was just another huge fun part for me of how to celebrate this wonderful movie that has is, is added so much to the Star Wars lexicon. I mean, really, it's, it's given us a lot of stuff. And I could even tell you, I could spend a, a significant amount of time telling you why I like and appreciate midichlorians too, quite honestly. Oh, I love the midichlorians. I, I, I think it's a great, uh, great addition to Star Wars. I think that's perfect, but controversial. Oh, yeah, well, well uh, <laughs> yeah, it is. But we'll, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll circle back on that another time because I okay. really think it's got a, a lot of wonderful merit, and it's got stuff there that George uh, had in place way back in the seventies as well. Uh, either of you have anything else you want to say about the Phantom Menace before we wrap up? Um, I think we should all go watch the Phantom Menace together. <laughs> Definitely. I love it. I love it. Well, uh, Ryder and Kelly, thank you both so very much for being on Coffee with Kenobi. Please let everyone know where they can reach out to you if they want to ask you a question or just say hello. And Kelly, let's start with you. Uh, sure. You can always find me on Twitter, probably too much on Twitter at, at Kelly underscore Knox. And Ryder, what about you? Yeah, I'm on Twitter. That's the best place for me is at Ryder Waldron DDS. And if you want to hear me talk more about Star Wars, you can hear me on the Idiots Ray podcast. And if you want to read some older blogs, you can go to coffeewithkenobi.com. There you go. And if you want to see something amusing, watch Ryder try to instigate uh, Corey and I talking about Pacific Rim on Twitter as well. Yes. Watch me light the internet on fire. There you go. (laughs) Good times. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are the podcast you're looking for. This is. Before we get to email, and I have a couple to share with you this week, I want to go ahead and thank our CWK sponsors, One Nation Coffee and Mouse Fan Travel. Be sure to support them the way they support our podcast. And remember to listen to new and archive shows of Coffee with Kenobi wherever you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Stitcher, YouTube, or our webpage, www.coffeewithkenobi.com, wherever you enjoy listening to your favorite shows. And if you listen to the show through iTunes, please leave us a review. You can also find us on social media apps such as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Pinterest, and would love for you to check us out there. Be sure to listen to our CWK family of shows, too, including Legends Library, Resistance Reactions, Comics with Kenobi, and Lattes with Leia. Please leave a review for each of their shows as well. Be sure to subscribe to each of them individually, as they all have their own feeds now. In addition to the places I just mentioned for Coffee with Kenobi, you can find me twice a month on the podcast Looking at Lucasfilm, part of the Jim Hill Media Network, as well as on Twitter at Mr. Zare, M-R-Z-E-H-R, and you can find my writings on CWK's website, where, of course, we just talked about I was one that got to share their favorite memories of The Phantom Menace. You can check out that article there. And there are a lot of other articles on StarWars.com, where I am, of course, an official blogger. And I also contribute to IGN, the Star Wars, and other popular culture topics. Don't forget to check out www.patreon.com slash coffee with Kenobi to help support the show and get access to CWK Prover, our exclusive podcast not heard anywhere else. There are also t-shirts, coffee mugs, and so much more. Our first email today comes from listener Bill Shee, S-H-E-E-H-Y. And Bill, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your last name. As you can probably imagine, it happens all the time with Zare. Either way, here is your email. 
Dan, in the words of our favorite desert hermit and former Clone War General, hello there. My name is Bill Sheehy, and we met very, very briefly at the Ark Bar in Chicago during Celebration. I just wanted to reach out and to tell you how much I appreciated your panel on covering Star Wars and hearing more about how you got started with your podcast and your work as a teacher. Your love for Star Wars is apparent, but I was completely blown away by how passionate you are as an educator and how seriously you take it. As someone who has worked with kids all my adult life and just about every capacity from after-school worker to substitute teacher, it really touched me, and as someone who has been active in the fandom from writing to podcasting, I'm really glad that we have someone like you as a spokesperson and fan. Thanks again for the wonderful panel, and it was so nice to meet you. All the best, Bill She. Bill, thank you so much for your incredibly wonderful and kind email. I really do appreciate that, both as an educator and just as someone who loves covering Star Wars through this awesome podcast, Coffee with Kenobi, that I've had so much fun with. And the main reason I've had so much fun is because of people like you and other great listeners who respond uh, in a very favorable way because they are having fun experiencing Star Wars and the saga and meeting new people. I think the more positive we are, the more we give to this community. And I think that's great. Now, again, being positive doesn't mean that you like everything because I don't think that's authentic. But I do think it's finding a way to appreciate and to understand things that may or may not resonate with us immediately, but we still see the merit and the value in them. So this is really, really great. I definitely think it's so important. The main thing that I like doing with my students, whether it's with Star Wars or Shakespeare or whatever else is going on, literature, Mark Twain, what have you, writing, I think if I can encourage them to be themselves and be the best version of themselves, then I feel like I am doing what I should be doing as a teacher. And I thank you again so very, very much. Our next email comes from listener Loke Lamb, and he writes, Hi, Dan Coffee with Kenobi fans. Relatively new listener just prior to Celebration, and I actually think I saw you at Celebration. Anyways, I love your podcast and your unique perspective as an educator, which brings up my question slash gripe about people who have complained about Star Wars. Do you think we as a culture have lost touch with our traditional myths? What I mean by that is our increased access to information, including entertainment, has traditionally mythological types of storytelling, but have they become too ancient by our modern society? Mythic storytelling, as you know, is meant to be read as an allegory for life, society, meaning of life, etc. But I feel like we have become too accustomed to storytelling that fits in every beat and explains the background of four characters. Example, the prequels. Part of the reason I love it is that it reads, if you ignore the cringy bits, like an old Greek tragedy, people... Rightly so criticize Anakin's 0-100 to turn to a villain, but to me, if you read in mythological terms, that is, reading it by subtext and allegory, the story beats presented in the film make sense. See also Luke and the Last Jedi, Snoke, Jedi vs. Sith, Ewoks, and the Force. I think this is a major reason why I love The Last Jedi so much. Not only did it tie one of the main concepts of the prequels, the failure of the Jedi, into storytelling, but it brought the operatic feel from the prequels into the dialogue and even the music. To me, it combines the best aspects of the original trilogy. The fun, quirkiness, character focus, and the prequel trilogy music and operatic storytelling slash dialogue. Sorry for the long email. Well, Loke, thank you so much. Don't be sorry at all. I love your email. I think it raises some really important questions that I think are worth discussing. I don't know that we've lost touch with the mythology because we have it in our DNA, whether we mean it or realize it or not. I mean, all the stories that we have, they all have beats and nods that are just sort of built into our DNA. I think uh, if you've got a chance to listen to my mythology of Star Wars panel from Celebration, which I'm sure that you probably have, I talk about that a little bit. But in essence, the Jungian archetypes that are inherent in stories, as Joseph Campbell believed, are everywhere. And whether we mean to or not, they're just a part of what we expect from TVs, whether it's streaming stuff or movies, both you know, on our screens or TVs or in a movie theater or plays or the theater or musicals. They all are part and parcel of that. And they all both objectively uh, as specifically they show us kind of what is important to us, whether it is inherent and specific or sort of understated or unrealized. It all is there. It all exists. As far as Anakin's turn, I'd certainly agree with you that the allegory in the subtext is there. I also think there is plenty of examples of context, and it has been um, slowly unraveled throughout the original, not the original, but through the prequels. Although, I do think it's fair that people think they're just sort of a random jump from being one way to suddenly helping to kill Mace Windu. 
But again, I think the psychological motivation that um, Anakin has, thinking he's going to save his wife, is undermined because of the careful machinations of Palpatine through the years to pepper into his head, hey, you can trust me, and if you don't, bad things are going to happen. He's desperate. He's been asked to suppress his real feelings for a long time, and it causes a lot of problems. That's just kind of a quick, kind of a spark notes version of that, but happy to explore it on a future show. Loke, thank you again so much for your great email. Thank you so much for taking time out of your week to join me here on Coffee with Kenobi. As I mentioned, next week I am going to be in Batu. That's right, I am going to Galaxy's Edge for a media preview. I cannot even tell you how excited I am. This might be the most excited I've been for an event since Coffee with Kenobi started. Uh, Maybe even more than the premiere of Solo. I don't know, it's hard to say. I just, this is just a perfect marriage for me of the things I love and am passionate about. Disneyland and Star Wars. I can't wait to share with you. I'm going to have a ton of interviews. There's going to be a lot of stuff on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. And of course, there'll be some exclusive stuff only found on our Patreon page. So be sure to sign up if you want to see some of the great things that are going to be occurring on Batu at Galaxy's Edge. Oh my goodness, I am so excited. I can't wait to bring you along for the ride. And who knows, maybe someday we will share a Fuzzy Tauntaun and Oga's Cantina, or who knows what else. Can't wait. If you have anything that you want me to check out specifically, please let me know, and I will be sure to get that answer for you. In the meantime, have a great week and weekend, and I will see you next time live from Batu. This is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here. Move along. Move along.